I'm Sophia Wanuna. Joining me now in studio is on my extreme left, Jadin Mwangeka, who is CEO of Cerebral Palsy Society of Kenya. And Monica Ngere, who I just talked to you about, she had a child who died from cerebral palsy and she wrote an open letter to the president, posted it on his Facebook page. If you have some time, you can quickly go there and you'll see it. Uh, but Monica, I'll begin with you to kindly just first take us through what got you to write this letter and some of the contents of it and why address it to the president. Okay, um, I, w I would say maybe, I don't want to say I was unlucky, but I got a baby who developed cerebral palsy mm -hmm. either as at the point of birth or six days later because he went into a coma. We're not quite sure where to place it, um, but later they would tell me there's a part of his brain that it didn't quite develop, something called a genesis of the corpus callosum, mm -hmm. the communicator in between the different parts of the brain that wasn't working. So that led to his milestones being delayed. You know, I noticed he wouldn't sit when he's supposed to sit at five months. He wouldn't eat so well as he's supposed to eat. Um, and I mean, the, the diagnosis was really funny. Mm -hmm. I had, at one point, um, my, my therapist who was dealing with uh, his, his legs, he had a, a congenital birth defect called, uh, called talips where you born with your feet like the way your your feet are stepping down like mm -hmm, this mm -hmm. for his they were like turned inside you know like this is the, the part that's supposed to step so yeah. they're like this right so we, as we're going through that treatment they said that the therapy said can you take him to mama lucy to check if he has uh rickets because mm -hmm. he's not developing well and then as we are waiting to see the doctor the doctor says by the way your son doesn't look very well he must have cerebral palsy and you know, I was taken aback because I'd never, okay, I had heard about cerebral palsy, but it's not something that occurred to me that this is what will happen um, after we've been through a long journey of comas mm -hmm. and you know, all this treatment. So after that, it became a journey of going to hospital, from hospital to hospital, constant hospitalization, seeking therapy, there's physiotherapy to help him, help him sit. There is uh, a bit of therapy for the eyes because he couldn't see very far. I mean, you'd be waving at the kid and he's simply not, not responding. Yeah. yeah, so it became a journey. He had to receive nutritional therapy from um, the hospital, you know, where they advise you on what, how you can feed him well so that he adds weight. And going through all that, I met mothers who had children like mine. Mm. And their struggles were real and painful. Let me tell you, Sophia, for me, I was lucky that somehow I had a good family, good friends that really accepted us. But that was not the case for other mothers. Mm. They tell you, like, my spouse walked out on me the moment I gave birth to this child. And they said, um, when in Chawi, I mean, you're, you're practicing witchcraft. Mm. This is not our blood. This is not our child, and I refuse to be a part of it. Mm. I went through that myself. And so when we were sitting there, I realized there's a big challenge in terms of finances, what you're required to buy, what they offer at the hospital. Fine, you'll go for therapy, but they'll say, this child needs a special seat that will help him, you know, sit properly. Mm -hmm. And when you go to the manufacturers or those who bring in those particular chairs, they tell you, mm -hmm. you need 30,000 to buy that chair. And there you're stuck. So we resort to other ways of getting the chairs. Like for me, I had my son uh, fabricate, I mean, my carpenter fabricate a chair him at a cost of 3,000 shillings and when when he eventually passed away this August I asked myself my journey is over but what about those women who we used to sit together and we're like oh mama baraka umefika mama purity umefika eh how are you how is the baby doing those women I left behind seeking therapy for their children those grandparents who their children walked away from their own babies and left the grandparents with a load. What happened to them? So I decided to write a letter to the president because I know he can do something. There is a gap in between the service provider and the government when it comes to, you know, helping these children with cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. It's not a matter of right that they receive free medical attention. It's not a matter of right that they receive these assistive de devices that they're supposed to get. If you go to our law, they're so shallow. They're so shallow about what a child with cerebral palsy should receive. So I felt it that I had to write to the president. Mm -hmm. I didn't even want to deal with the cabinet secretary. 
I doubt he has even time for me. Maybe he has bigger problems. He has had Kenyatta uh, workers are about to go on strike. But I figured I've seen our president reaching out to, you know, young people with talent who maybe are stuck with school fees problems. I've seen him reach out to, you know, people who said, I, I need to do a kidney treatment and I can't afford it. I said, this is the man I need to talk to. So there I sat down in my sorrow. I said, I will not be bogged down by what I went through. I want to do something for the rest who are remaining. And we'll talk more about some of the things you wrote in that letter to the president. Uh, let me come to you, Jordan, yes. and listening to her talk. First, talk to us about cerebral palsy. What condition, what disease is this? Before I start, I would like to identify with what uh, she has said. Mm -hmm. That is the correct uh, standing or position for cerebral palsy. And I would like to say that cerebral palsy is a developmental disability. And it is one that affects the motor part of the brain. As you hear, she says that her child went to her, into a coma. Those are some of the things that bring about cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. And cerebral palsy is not a disease, by the way. It is a condition. And when it affects the motor part of the brain, you find that the child has got delayed milestones. A child will never attain some when of When you say delayed milestones is to do those things that a child would do at a certain age. Like now the, the firmness of the neck. Okay. The sitting, the crawling, even stretching, you know, the limbs. Mm -hmm. And I want to say that her child has lived only for two years. Mine has lived for 23 years. Yesterday was his 23rd birthday. And the challenges she has gone through is what I am seeing because for me I deal with very many mothers who come, some of them even come crying. Because once you get a child with cerebral palsy, then you are, your life changes drastically. And as she says at that uh, the men just walk away. It is true I deal with women, 60% of them don't have fathers or spouses for these children. Why? Sorry, because of the stigma that is attached to it. Mm -hmm. Because people think it is a curse. And normally because you are the one who carries nine months. You are the one who is a mother. Then it is you who bears the brunt. The in-laws sometimes are so, you know, harsh. And yet you are the one who is going through a more harsh, you know, uh, period of time when you get a baby who is not bouncy, a baby who has got so many other issues, a baby like my son is 23, but up to now we are using diapers. Up to now we are feeding him because his limbs are so uncoordinated. And when she says that she wants to, you know, to reach the president, I have written, in fact that is why I'm bringing this, just to show that there are some letters I've written. I've written to the minister of labor under whom we fall, I've written to the, to the Cabinet Secretary of Health. I have written to National Council of People with Disability. But my last letter I wrote to, you know, uh, the, the head of uh, staff, the Cabinet Secretary. You know, because I am so desperate to reach somebody who will hear my, my story. Mm. And for me, it is not just a story for me alone, but a story for the women whom I deal with. And the other thing is, there is a fund. National Council has a fund. Unfortunately, the structure of the fund is such that it is for empowerment. So I'm asking, if you want to empower people who are talking, who can work like me, it is fine. By the way, I have no issue with that. But how about the CP child who is not able to talk, who is not able to walk, who is not able to do anything, what you call daily living activities. You know, the feeding, the dressing, the bathing, the toileting. He cannot do it for himself. So where does that leave him? Why is he being discriminated? Is it because he cannot talk? Then we are doing nothing about mainstreaming. Okay. Yes. All right, let me come back to you, Monica. Mm -hmm. And you get this child and there are all these myriad of issues. Did you have another child before him or, and were you married at the time? Um, I actually have a seven-year-old girl and she was okay. I mean, she has no medical challenges. I think the most I've ever taken her to hospital for is a cold, mm -hmm. a common cold. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was not expecting this. I'll be very honest with you, this was a surprise. You know how you go through pregnancy. Find the pregnancy was also problematic. But then there I was, I was hopeful that, you know, I'd have another bouncing 
baby and I fact I knew the sex I knew the it would be a boy mm -hmm. so I was, I was saying my my family is complete you know and I was in a stable relationship as at the time that I had the baby but when the baby came like she explained I I received backlash from my in-laws and or potential in-laws because we were heading towards marriage and they said eh he said I'm here too I mean, we don't have this kind of genes in our family. And so, in fact, the, the grandmother, the paternal grandmother, never came to see Baraka in hospital. We were admitted three weeks after birth, um, for three weeks, yani, the, the period. Of, so mean, she just had what she, was she, happening. She and had and to decided come. to never, she never saw that boy until the day the boy passed on. In fact, even when he passed on, she couldn't come to the funeral. And it's sad, the level of ignorance that people have, because then I received all the blame. And when I look at the causes of cerebral palsy, I'll be honest with you, some of them are beyond you, because it can happen before, during, or after birth. Talk to us about some of those causes, because okay. I, what I understand is you've also done a lot of research. You're not yeah. a doctor, mm. but since then you've done a lot of research yeah. um, in as far as this is concerned. During birth, uh, a lot of things happen. Like, for example, when a baby, you know, immediately is born, they're expected to cry. And what that, that does is it opens the lungs, then the baby can receive oxygen to the vital parts of the brain. If you have prolonged labor, you know, somehow the oxygen supply is dwindling, mm -hmm. you know, and sometimes even the baby can roll himself in, a, in the umbilical cord, get choked off. So supply to the brain in terms of oxygen mm -hmm. is not there. Even during birth, I mean, a lot, there's trauma. Sometimes they mishandle the baby, especially in cesarean section. After birth, if the baby doesn't cry, I mean, uh, they're supposed to quickly respond and try and give the baby oxygen. Mm -hmm. If they delay and do not notice that this is a blue baby as they call, they are called, babies who don't have oxygen in the moment they are born, mm -hmm. then that will cause permanent brain damage. So do you know in your case what went wrong? I'd say first maybe the pregnancy was a bit problematic. Could have happened then because when we la were last admitted in May this year, we are asked to do uh, a CT scan. Again, another expense that most cerebral palsy parents have to go through. Mm -hmm. There are no CT scans in our public hospital. One CT scan costs 6000 to 8000 So you tell me about a parent who does not work because she has to take care of this baby 24 hours, then pay 6000 for a CT scan. But non nonetheless, when they did the CT scan, they said a, the part of the brain that was affected is known as the corpus callosum, which is generally the communicator between the four parts of the brain. Mm -hmm. You have that communicator, I have that communicator. His is dead. So what happened is there's some fluid there's a balance of the brain that must be there in between the parts and it's it's balanced by the spinal fluid i mean there's that ratio so he's he had more cerebral spinal fluid to fill in that gap of the part of the brain that did not de develop for me i think it either happened during the because i had a, a cesarean section mm -hmm. or the fact that he did not cry, they even told me he had a low AGPA score. There is a way they score a baby mm -hmm. when you're born mm -hmm. in terms of did the baby cry, okay. how did the baby appear. All right. Or it happened when he went into a coma six days after birth. So, all right. So, Monica, we'll continue to chat. Jaden, back to you. Mm -hmm. Your child is now, your son, 23 mm -hmm. years. Yes. Um, how is it you've been able to cope despite the challenges you say that are in the sector in as far as ensuring that mothers such as yourselves uh, perhaps don't have such a hard time and there is help and support uh, from our, uh, our health system? How is it you've coped? Uh, when I got my baby, and by the way, that was that's my firstborn, and I, we waited for a child for eight years, and then when the baby was born, it the cord re went round the neck twice and round. So the doctors told me that the baby may not be okay, but I didn't know the extent to which they were, you know, giving that warning. So as we 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 brought up the baby or after as we looked out after the baby mm -hmm. we realized that uh, the baby was not sitting the neck was wobbling and everything was just turning out than we expected it was very devastating however as we went on we realized that uh, it is something we cannot change and then immediately the boy was about three years we also came into contact with the Cerebral Palsy Society of Kenya, which had just been formed in 94 and was, record, was uh, registered in 96. 
So when we went into as members, we realized that we were not alone. We realized that we could share our experiences. We could even, you know, compare and say, oh, this guy is even smiling and their child is worse than mine. Let me, you know, take up the pieces and move on. So it has not been easy, by the way. However, my immediate family, my nuclear family, accepted the boy. And my husband, we are still together. My children today even take care of their brother. But it has not been easy. And then when now we continued with the cerebral palsy, I became the assistant chair, the chair, and now I'm the one who is heading. Okay. So for me, I'm in a position where I encourage mothers. I tell them, this, just accept. Because if God realized, looked at you and gave you this, this child, because children are a gift from God, then just accept and God will give you the grace to continue. So let's focus on the insufficiencies that yes. are in these hospitals because then that where, that's where the problem is at. What for you is your experience? What is it you'd like done exactly? Okay, um, let, me, let me just compare the hospitals that I went to and I highlighted in the, in in the story. Letter, yeah. There was Pumwani Maternity where I had the baby and immediately they had started treating my baby for talips club foot as it as it is known mm -hmm. and that was on a tuesday and then on wednesday they'd handle children with cerebral palsy but if you go to that particular unit apart from a very interesting big ball that has spikes i don't know what they use that for because i never got to that stage there is not much in terms of equipment even for the club foot treatment which again you have to realize cerebral palsy patients have other complications yes. apart from just the mm -hmm. fact that you have brain damage and maybe your growth and your development is slow. So the, the facilities are wanting. The facilities are wanting. Let me go to Thika District Hospital. What I experienced there was insufficiency in terms of personnel. So we'd, we'd, we'd actually go in the morning or sometimes my mother would take him because then we relocated to Thika for a bit because we needed that care from mm. my mother. I was also not very well. So we'd go there in the morning and leave like late in the afternoon at three and when you get one appointment you have to the next appointment will be like three weeks and this is a child that needs weekly 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 therapy if not daily depending on the severity then we go to Kenyatta Kenyatta um, my challenge there was okay there's a good physiotherapy section there is a good orthopedic section which my son was receiving treatment for there's a good nutritional therapy section but this, these are all different departments so I'd be in hospital Tuesday Wednesday Thursday okay and, and you're using fair and you're paying for each clinic it's not for free then we, when you go to physiotherapy where they have the equipment what they've done they've improvised you know an equipment that should clearly come with manufactured scientific standards is just a piece of wood cobbled together and you know given a bit of a shiny feel and a bit of you know ornaments for the babies as they you know try and when they're held there so that they get the control some small toys that are even broken um it's terrible it is terrible in terms of facilities were totally down and out mm. and i tell you sophia if a lot more could go into in terms of getting this therapy to our children let me give you an example in the month of june and july i was in kenyatta hospital my child was being treated now at that point they had said he will need brain surgery to drain the excess cerebral spinal fluid and he would have a therapist every morning come to our bed and you take him through physiotherapy. This boy improved to the point when we were going home, he immediately sat, did not need his nanny chair, did not need his nanny chair. That just told me that if this child could have received this therapy from mm -hmm. Thika the Hospital from the beginning, like every day or at least twice a week, this baby could have done much more than he did before he passed on. I saw this baby grabbing things, you know, like you'd be holding him. Mm -hmm. he, he didn't have control of his hands. So he'd be throwing them like this, I think, his way of playing. But he reached a point he could grab your phone. It reached a point he could sit and watch TV. And I thought, all this is because of the therapy he's receiving. Mm. So it's not a hopeless situation. It's just that there's no attention coming yeah. from the ministry and other stakeholders to yeah. help. How is it that you, you said you've also written, tried to reach out to these mm. um, various stakeholders to try and help? Yes. CPSK, what mm. real engagement must happen now going forward to ensure we don't have 
what we had with the loss, unfortunately, of Baraka. What should happen is that they should look at the person, the children who have got cerebral palsy. Let them not even bother about, you know, the parents giving them empowerment before they deal with the issue of the child who has got cerebral palsy. Like I'll tell you, uh, when I received the last letter, which was a res response to mine from uh, head of uh, public service, I was told that cerebral uh, National Council, sorry, engages six programs. One of them is the program where the people with albinism are given sunscreens. And in the budget, even if you go now, budget for last year and this year, there's a hundred million that has been set aside for mm. albinism. So when I was having a meeting with uh, uh, somebody in the cabinet office, I asked him, is it because I am not known that I, my children are not being taken care of? Because if you look at sunscreens and therapy, what she's talking about, those are intervention measures. Why are they being done in a lopsided manner? Because if you are going to look after albinism, because they are prone to, you know, cancer of the, the skin. My children, I call them my children because they are all mine. Mm -hmm. My children have got this issue of if you don't intervene, as she's saying, before her child died, he had made some progress. Therapy is like food on the table for me and you. Therapy for us in the clinic, we give it twice. But these are mothers who are so desperate. They cannot afford. They cannot afford to, to give the children, you know, the, the assistive measures. Mm. And right. we find them, we have to buy those ones. Mm. Unless you are registered by National Council. Registration is so cumbersome. So that intervention, early intervention, by the way, is very important. Because if you don't intervene early, you find there is something we call contractures or secondary deformities. All right. So you will avoid that if there is early intervention. Unfortunately, our time yes. is up, but yeah. I'll give you each a minute. And assuming the cabinet secretary, the president, or his people is watching, uh, are watching this morning, what is it you'd like to say? What's your message? Okay, first you can look into that okay, camera. camera first, first and foremost, for me, it'd be, it be very simple. Kenya has uh, signed and ratified the International Convention on the, on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Mm -hmm. And this, this means that, you know, somehow we have an international obligation to reach up to those standards. Mm -hmm. If you look at that particular um, um, uh, convention vis-a-vis -vis our Persons with Disabilities Act, you can clearly see the Persons with Disabilities Act deal so much extensively with the issue of discrimination, equal employment opportunities, things about voting and things like that. But no one is taking care of the issue of children with cerebral palsy or children with disabilities. In fact, there is a disconnect. It's like, let me give you just one quick example. They say that, you know, the functions of the council under Section 7 of that particular act is to register persons with disabilities, institutions that offer help, mm -hmm. and then the fourth category, persons with disabilities who con whose condition requires constant medical attention for purposes of availing subsidized medical services. So this is already a duty of, of the council. Like, you're supposed to make sure that this therapy is affordable. Okay. If you ask a mother 4,000, 5,000 per yeah. week mm -hmm. for therapy, you're not helping this mother who's not right. able to work. Okay. It's not. And finally for you, Georgia. Now, for me, I would like uh, a level playing field where the people, the guardians, the parents, the caregivers are given a voice because they are the ones who are talking for these children. Secondly, there should be intervention for any child suffering from cerebral palsy, as uh, Monica is saying. And thirdly, there should be uh, the, the tax exemption issue. If there is somebody to be given a tax exemption, is it somebody with disability who is able to work, or a mother or a father for that matter, or pa a parent, one of the parents, to be able to take care? Because I've told you my, my baby is 23 years. I call him a baby because he is a baby. He's 23 years to yesterday, but he is still fed. He is still, you know, he has no toilet, uh, whatever, experience. Because we have to time, we, we have to put diapers on him. And diapers are not cheap. And therefore, let us have a situation where the act, the one she's quoting, the act, 2003, should be, now it is being, uh, uh, it's being reviewed. Mm. It should be implemented, it should be, it should be impl implemented 
totally not in bits to suit people who are able to talk okay. and yet there are far more children who are vulnerable and they are not being helped at all ladies i thank you both for being with us this morning to shed the light to put that spotlight especially more so for you after having lost your son and we pray that you continue to heal and be strong and continue to bring attention to this because it is people like yourselves that definitely bring change where it is most needed and in this particular situation definitely mm -hmm. a lot must be done to address the plight of the suffering from cerebral palsy so thank you for thank being you. with us and we thank you as well for watching the show today that is where we will end it on behalf of everyone that made it possible we thank you always for watching and we'll see you again tomorrow have a lovely day